far away. So great to be here today with Ian Glendening, who um, I I got to through Sevilla King from Equality Existence. She recommended that I talk to Ian, and so I'm really excited to hear more about you, Ian. And uh, I'd love to have you start by telling us kind of how you grew up, what you were like as a kid, what interested you, and yeah. uh, then from there, how you got to where you are today, the way that you think and, and the way that you live. And I understand that your day job is as an engineer. So um, you might be able, might talk a little bit about your education. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, from the north of England, um, northeast of England on the coast here. Um, and in fact, I'm actually living within about five miles of where I was originally born and raised, but I've been all around the world in between with various work. Um, so... Originally, I'm, I'm, I'm an engineer, so I qualified in aer aeronautical engineering, worked in aerospace for a while on aircraft, military aircraft, and transferred over into the energy industry after a relatively few years. So I had a long um, career in the energy business, oil and gas and nuclear and other processes. Um, and as such, I was a fairly typical geeky sort of STEM kind of person. You know, I was the maths, physics and chemistry Top of the class kind of person at school and went off to even do an when, engineering. Even when you were a little kid? Yeah, obviously, it, because being where we are, I had a lot of interest in the outdoor, in natural outdoors. But um, yeah, it, to the point that even in fact, if we move on to later, but, but looking back at it now, I was very, um, although I read a lot of technical books associated with the topics I was learning, I was never much of a reader. Um, if you want to know more things that influenced me at that time, I was um, probably things like um, Jacob Bronowski's Ascent of Man was made a big impression on me as, as, as a schoolboy. Um, really? Well, what yeah. age are you talking about here? <laughs> uh, actually, I can't remember exactly when that was. Now. It was 60s, wasn't it? So I would have been a teenager, a young teenager. Um so, so it kind of conf like, confirmed my interest. Let me ask you one question that yeah. I find really interesting mm. with people who have mm. had an interesting trajectory in life. And that is, mm. what kind of things did you get in trouble with when, for when you were in elementary school? Because I always think that kind of shows where your strengths are, the kind of things that you got in trouble for. <laughs> That's interesting, because I'm probably quite boring in that respect. You know, I was a bit of a geeky swap kind of a person. Um, so I wasn't much in trouble at school for things. I mean, apart from, you know, it would have been the things that didn't fit that um, uh, techie mold. So, um, you know, English language and literature, I'd, I would have been late and delinquent on um, assignments and things. But um, I was generally, a, you know, a conscientious kid at school. And so there wasn't much I got into trouble for. And I say most of the stuff outside school was the fact that we lived on the edge of a large piece of moorland and hills. So I, we spent most of our time oh. just exploring the... You know, so getting home late for tea and things like that would uh -huh. have been the, would be about as severe a crime as I would have committed in those days. When you talk about that, into my mind comes all the George MacDonald novels I've read. <laughs> <laughs> you, you ever read any George no, MacDonald? I don't know him, no. Oh, no. my goodness. He, and he writes so beautifully of that area. And uh, so I've never been there, but I can certainly picture it in my mm. life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so, you know, relatively sheltered life, relatively traditional in terms of getting interested in this subject, which became my university degree, which became the root of my career. So fairly. So, so when you were growing up, was yeah. there any uh, faith tradition in your family? Um, no, um, my mother's always been a church goer, but even she, if you ask her, would say she didn't really believe in God. She sees that as more of a community thing. And certainly, no, we, my dad wasn't, and it was never part of our, and even I went to a school that had religious assemblies and had a religious heritage, um, Protestant Christian heritage. Um, it was not very high profile for anybody. So it's yeah. just not, not a big part of life. Yeah. So we have a lot of um, resonance there because I, I had absolutely no faith background growing up either. So, yeah. yeah. I understand what that's like. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So yeah. you're an geeky kid. And by the time you're in high school, you're reading Jacob Bernowski's Ascent of Man. That's just fascinating yeah. to me. Well, originally, of course, it was a, a, a very successful television series, a documentary series. Uh huh. But I have, in fact, got the book and read the book several times since as well. But 
and uh, I was I was just so oblivious about the world when I was in high school I I Mm. don't think I was even thinking I can't Mm. even remember thinking deeply about things so um then to hear about somebody who's thinking so deeply about things that they're they're um looking into physics and math and technology and the ascent of man that's pretty fascinating Mm. I wouldn't say in those days the ascent of man made me prompted particularly deep thinking it probably just kind of reinforced the idea that um scientific knowledge was kind of pretty crucial to how man had progressed in, mm-hmm. in recent centuries um i probably didn't well again i know i didn't really think about it anything like as deeply as i've done in the last 20 years mm-hmm. which is where i am now but um but he, he remained uh, sort of a bit of a hero just from his um presentation and uh, his um academic assuredness in mm-hmm. being able to talk about so many things mm-hmm. a big impression on me so then you went into aeronautical engineering and eventually into yeah. the energy industry yeah yeah so that was all fairly mechanical in a in a sort of literal and metaphorical sense so it was um progression of becoming more expert in certain things getting more responsibility for more things getting promotions and fairly fairly traditional sort of career path to the point where I became sort of management of, of ever larger groups and projects, uh, up to sort of 200 people. Um, at that point, I decided it wasn't the route I really wanted to go and sort of got more back into the technical side of it. And of course, in that time, so we, we're talking about a career that started sort of late 70s. Um, as we go th- sort of into the 90s, everything's about computing and information technology, mm-hmm. of course, whichever, whichever engineering discipline you're in, there's more and more of that. So whether it was modelling, you know, finite element modeling of structures or compressible computational fluid dynamics and things like that. a lot of high tech computing things to do with the engineering, but also just like everybody else, more and more IT to do with just the business of doing business and communicating and generating documents and so on, and the whole all of the whole quality control around that. So that, that's the sort of direction I went. Um, and. Again, mostly office-based in the early years, but the more I got exposed, obviously you have training periods where you're on physical construction sites and physical manufacturing facilities, but towards the end of that part of my career, sort of mid-90s, as well as getting more and more interested in the information technology, partly because it was the information, not the technology, there was a, a long-standing problem in the industry of managing the information when even when it was just drawings and documents there was always a long-standing problem if you build a very complex facility or a very complex aeroplane or whatever it is you're actually creating people need a lot of documentation to understand how to operate it and maintain it and what to do when things you know and so on um and in the sort of construction industry where it really is um hard hats and boots on the ground is the actual technology of doing the work there's a massive technology mismatch between the way sort of designs and engineering is done and the actual way the job is done hands-on. So there used to be huge de- deficiencies in information that was available at the end of projects. So owners put a lot of emphasis on standardizing how information was managed <clears throat> in the sort of completion of projects. And that's what really got me into information as a thing in its own right beyond just the information technology. Could I just add a clarification there? When you talk yeah. about the the uh, the gap between um, mm-hmm. the the actual project itself, what got completed, and then the information that was available afterwards, are you speaking there to this idea that everything is more complicated than we think it is? So once you actually start the building process, you find that you need a lot more, or that you learn a lot more and develop a lot more information by the time you're done than what people had already put into the model before you start. And then that you need to find a way to uh, document that information. Is that what you mean? It's not actually what I was referring to. Obviously it's become complexity as an issue has become very much a central theme in information management and in just managing organizations generally. Um, when I mentioned it there, I was really just talking about the fact that there was a bit of a mismatch in the physical technology between people working in an office, maybe using fairly sophisticated tools to design things and creating you know, deliverables, documents and drawings and things that people would work to, 
Um, and then the processes that people will be doing hands-on in an actual manufacturing or construction mm -hmm. facility. There was naturally a fairly big gap between the technology of the information. So not surprisingly, just by questions of competence and, and in fact, relevance, because when people are kind of building something, they're concerned about the materials they need to build it, things arriving on time to build it, the logistics of mm -hmm. things. They don't really care about how the thing actually works when they've finished and who's going to actually maintain it when they've finished. It's not the first thing on their um, agenda. So not surprisingly, big gaps would turn up in the information. So sophisticated clients got very um, concerned with making sure a project done in such a way that at the end of a physical project, you'd have what's now typically called a digital twin. So as well as having the actual thing built, you'd have a very sophisticated information model of the thing built as well. Um, it's digital twin, and that's become so the sort so of... So that it can be replicated. It's not being replicated, but also you can diagnose things. So if you find, if you have a problem with one item on a plant, you can find it in the design, and you can find all of the other relationships about, you know, what it was designed for, what the conditions were... How, how the particular model was selected or whatever. So you'd, you'd, get, you'd get back to a lot of relationships from one physical thing in the field or one physical um, sort of icon on your control screen where if you're operating a plant through a computer or something. Um, Isn't that one of the big problems relations. we have now with like GPT-4? They, they, can't, yep. they, they can't look at it to figure out what's in there. So. Yeah. Yes, and look, well, in those days we were doing this by actually fairly formally modeling it, which was we would actually try and build a model that represent what I've just been arm waving, you know, that this thing is connected to this thing and this thing has that property. This thing has this operating case and this operating case has these properties. And they would be literally, as I'm waving my hands, that's what the model was. It was a, a semantic web of, of mm -hmm. information that, that meant something, how you classified all of the connections. Um, as, but yeah, but when you get things like GPT and, and these sort of language-based AI uh, applications. None of these relationships were built into the original information. They were just like a document or a post or a letter with a heading and a name and then free form text in between. And the technology, the, the sort of AI, as people call it, I'm personally pretty skeptical about it, but the so-called artificial intelligence would be looking for patterns and constructing the patterns for itself in order to add some value and give you back some information that it's discovered. Mm -hmm. We were doing it in a much more formal way of making sure those relationships were in the model, in the electronic model mm -hmm. when we built it. Mm -hmm. and, um, but in fact, you ended with a hybrid because you, it was a kind of just in time or just in case, as I tend to call it, where you can't model every eventuality. So eventually you do have to have tools that can discover things as well as as well as well read the things you've mentioned explicitly. So you end up with hy hybrid systems now in the, a bit of both, a bit of pattern finding as well as reading patterns that are explicitly made. Well, the reason I asked you about that is just yesterday, somebody posted on Twitter uh, an essay from 2017. I can't remember the author's name. Wait, Jay Salvatier? John Salvatier. And uh, John Salvatier <clears throat> had written this essay about how everything is just more complicated than you think it is. I mean, it's a yeah. pretty obvious idea, but he went into detail first about how to build a set of stairs, which you think would be yeah. a pretty straightforward thing. And then he went into detail about, you know, yeah. moving up the scale into more and more complex things. There is so much that you think it's going to work a certain way and then you get started mm -hmm. on it. And there are always measurement problems. There are always, um, yeah. as you said, materials problems and, and all of that kind of thing that comes up. And so mm -hmm. how is any sort of like robotic, entity going to yeah. face those things without the information ahead of time and often yeah. information is not available ahead of time absolutely so there's different levels of, of example in there um so building a stair in, in a in a sort of building um is one level of complexity and as you say if you analyze what actually goes into it and it actually working and being in the right place and functioning there's a lot more to it than just the dimensions on a drawing you know so yeah. it is everything's more complicated than that first level of information um, so there's different levels. So that idea, and of course, in the industry that I've been in, people would generally talk about a pump or a valve or something like that and would discuss that rather than a civil structure like a like a staircase. But again, every every facility's got stairs in it as mm -hmm. well. Um, so it's, it is a good example. Um, we use tables and chairs as well as just simple examples. Um, 
I tend to use, I don't, I don't know how well it translates um, across the Atlantic, but I tend to use the difference between a, a calling a spade a spade, knowing the difference between mm-hmm. a spade and a shovel. Mm-hmm. There's a very simple example of you know how would you specify what you meant when you said a spade as opposed to a shovel, and it's I use it I use it as a challenge to people to say well actually just try and do that just spend five minutes trying to write down what you think the specification would look like and it's just an exercise to say actually there's a lot more to this. That's so fascinating point. because I always yeah. thought that that was referring to cards, a spade rather than a heart. You know, call a spade uh, a spade. Uh, uh, and what is the difference between a spade and a shovel? Well, the learning point is the difference is there is a difference in the general shape, um, which you could then specify lots of detail about, you know, having a flat part and a curved part and a handle and things like that. But the real difference is what it's intended to be used for. And an awful lot, what you discover, the learning point you discover as you write more complex specifications for things is an awful lot of things are not definitively define in terms of physical properties so you can define a spade as simply something on the end of a handle that's a stiff fat, flat blade um, but when you say shovel um, you're saying it's got some sort of curved edges to contain stuff that you um, hoist up rather than just drive in to the ground so there's a, there's a functional uh-huh. and there's a functional difference uh-huh. which leads to some physical differences but if you just describe the physical differences you don't really get the essence of the difference and you, re- you discover more and more that functional it's the fun it's the intended to be used for kind of statements that carry most of the meaning to a to another human down the line um so just to finish the point about complex things being more complex than you think so yeah so if you were in the sort of civil engineering building industry where thing was a staircase that you and I understand as a staircase, there's obviously a health and safety element in the sense of it's got to be, it's got to fit in the right place without any gaps and be strong enough to support the load and things. Um, but most people have quite a lot of familiarity with those things. They're kind of everyday objects. So there's a, there's a diminishing return in how much detail you specify other than just say, give me a staircase according to this standard specification and then people just know what to do because it's a staircase. In, in the sort of aerospace and energy industries, you have much larger consequential health and safety things. If somebody makes a, makes a mistake, you know, it's not just one life or one broken leg. You know, you might have, you might flatten the nearby town or something. So, uh, so much more emphasis is put on um describing everything that needs to be described and partly that's the kind of insurance policy it's 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 a lot of it to be honest a lot of it is to do with whose fault it is if it goes wrong you know it's, it's what i call um metaphorical postmortems it's unfortunate there might well be real postmortems as well but it's in, in the metaphorical it's sort of legal kind of postmortem what went wrong an awful lot of stuff is specified in an awful lot more detail and you you still get this diminishing return issue which is you might have specification which makes it clear whose responsibility some detail was that did or didn't happen but it might still not it might still not stop it happening because not everybody can read everything when they're doing every job it's just impossible so so that and in fact we're getting into we're getting into the space now which is i would say sort of during the late nine during the 90s basically i began to see that there was an awful lot missing from our sort of physical assumptions about physical models of the world and that's really that's actually really what got me into space i am now thinking about information as in a more fundamental sense as a fundamental part of reality and and what is physical reality anyway particularly when you bring in things that you've already used now questions of you know faith and spirituality kind of issues um but also i think there are quite a lot of things that are beyond certainly beyond orthodox science um that are to do with human behavior and psychology and knowledge in the sense of how do humans know not just a piece of information written down in an explicit form So somehow all of this got you to thinking along the lines of, or you started looking into cybernetics. Is that, is that kind of where that started? Yeah, it was, that was a fairly casual connection in the original case. Yeah. Cause the the sort of entity that I said it was called Cybertron and I was, I I would knew I was dealing with a, a state of the world where all information was practically all information was electronic. So Tron and cyber uh, as in cybernetics, but with PSY in the cyber, so that it was very much about the human 
understanding of information as opposed to its explicit definition. So, so I could you, could you back up just a little bit for me yeah. and for others who might mm. not know and mm. tell us what cybernetics is. <clears throat> and then... Right. <clears throat> Yes, well, cybernetics is the. I've just been writing a, just been writing a piece on this today. Uh, it comes in several forms, and part of the problem is people's experience of it. So, cybernetics is really the science of how systems, particularly complex systems, control themselves. Um, so it's, um, I mean, cybernetics. The word just literally means governance. That's what the word means. Um, now. When it, we can have a good bit of history of how how it, it was coined by Norbert Wiener just after the Second World War as a, as a term, and when he coined it, he meant what I just said, which was how human endeavor organized and managed itself, controlled itself, managed itself, governed itself. Of course, very quickly in that second half of the twentieth century. Almost all control systems were sort of electromechanical control systems. So people got into their heads that cybernetics was about electromechanical control systems, which is in fact in the jargon of the original founders, Norbert Wiener and all the people at the Macy conferences after the Second World War. That was the second thing they were thinking about. They were thinking about um, humans as living animals. And how how do we organize and manage ourselves? So it takes you right into governance, you know, in a sort of you know governmental sense as well as in a sort of everyday how do we make decisions sense. So it's scalable. So now when we talk about cyberspace, we're actually misusing cyber. What we, yes, and of course, they, like everything, words have their own life. Once you've coined them, they don't. Yeah. You have no control over the definitions, and in fact, we could talk about definitions as well. That's part of my interest in information is is what a definition's worth. Um, yeah, so whatever these people meant when they first wrote it is irrelevant now because it's a piece of history. But in fact, most people, because most of the second half of the twentieth century is about increasing computerization of things, mm -hmm. and almost everything to do with cybernetics was a, to do with electronic and electromechanical control, and so cyberspace when it was being coined around 2000 you know, and then coming into the 21st century um was definitely talking about this space created by linked electronic information so when people say cyberspace now that's pretty much what they mean with or without levels of human interaction with or without levels of sort of ai or automated uh, processing mm -hmm. they're talking about this environment of electronic information yeah absolutely but again, for me, that's a sort of that's um, that's a problem I have to overcome in explaining the value of other aspects of cybernetics. To the point that people people pick different names. You know, when one name goes out of fashion because it gets usurped by one use, you have to find another name. So the most neutral name that I'm using now that most people are using is basically just called systems thinking or mm -hmm. complex systems thinking. Because even when it was cybernetics, you have to remember. This was after the Second World War, and there had been a whole round of this after the end of the, between the wars, after the First World War, between the wars, of brains trying to find better ways of understanding and organising the world. You know, these were two huge disasters that happened to mankind. Mm -hmm. you know, the bomb at the end of the Second World War and everything. People were saying, there's got to be a better way. We must be able to organise things better than, so this doesn't happen again. Right? So there was an awful lot of um, intellectual effort went into these things around that time. Um, but something like cybernetics as a as electronic and electromechanical control systems, um, it is it has a life it has a life of its own. And it just took off. Um, but the, but the actual original thoughts about how do we actually understand what a system is, what makes something a system, uh, and there are different classifications of system. Um, simple. Sort of first order systems where essentially you would think of that as maybe a thermostat in your in your um, domestic heating and cooling system. You know, so there'd be a very simple electromechanical system there. Um, so that would be a uh, first order system where all the controls are essentially closed loop feedback. You know, so if something's measuring the temperature and if it's too high, it sends a signal to cool. If it's too 
hot, it sends it too cold, it sends a signal to warm. And these are just feedback based um, control systems because, of course, they become so ubiquitous in every device that we deal with. It becomes the main kind of system associated with cybernetics. Could, could we also put in that category like a lock and a key? Um, well, yeah, in the fit mechanical and, and the world of just physics itself, physics, physicists will talk about everything they're dealing with as a system, whether it's the locking system for a door or, or um, the system of um, electrons orbiting an atom. You know, the, the, the word system gets kind of used at every level of scale. We're talking about the, mm -hmm. the, the solar system or cosmology itself, or, or whether you write down to... Uh, subatomic um physics people will use the word system so yeah we the word system this in a way this is one of the it's one of its strengths and one of its problems is it's such a scalable way of thinking that you can be talking about completely different things with different sets of problems and properties using the same word so that's good and bad of course okay so for, that's first order thinking then what's second order thinking second order is realizing that quite a lot of control systems have feed forward in them as well uh, you tend to, you would tend not to have it in um in simple systems as simple as the one I said, there'd be, there'd be systems whereby there are many different control variables, some of which are driving in the direction you're trying to go, and others are maybe counterbalancing with feedback, but there's a main feed forward in it. So if you've got a mix of feedback and feed forward, you've got a second order system. Could you give me an example of feed forward? It's easy if we go to level three. Um, Uh, yeah, well, um, obviously the, the control systems on most automobiles these days um, are electronic, so there are feed-forward loops. Um, so there's mechanical governance in the engine, which is for a certain amount of fuel and airflow, it will achieve a certain speed and power. But you're actually putting in a, a demand signal through your right foot to say, I want more speed. And so that's feeding forward, and it's going to... Eventually, there'll be, there'll be something... Well, there isn't actually... And how sophisticated cars get, they're even more sophisticated now, but sort of in a simple, naturally aspirated liquid fuel engine. Um, so the feed forward requires an actual... agent yeah. to intervene? Yes. Now, and again, that's when you get to third order ones. So so, so that would be second order. And and for, for that second order system of the car and its control system, this human with, a, with an active foot is outside that system. It's just mm -hmm. treated as this is the more complicated bit we can't um, we can't model. Are we choosing not to model? And we will just take the position of that person's foot as the demand. We won't worry about their thought process of how fast they want to go or anything like that. We'll just take the position of the foot as the demand for speed, say. Okay. Second order. Third order is when you actually introduce the intentional agents in the system as systems in their own right. So you, that gives, we put in both feed forward and the important part of it being when you when you start to introduce humans into the system and you're still calling them systems you know they're not machines they're things that have life purposes you know which are beyond beyond where you want to get them on that current journey in the car um, you have other purposes of life sustaining life mm -hmm. making progress for you as well as making progress for those around you and you know the, the hierarchy of kind of demands that you get from sort of maslow and things like that but um yeah but when you start to model the what would previously been thought of as the observer, the person, the, the actual person with the intent intention of doing something with the result. Um, yeah, in second order modeling, you would just leave those outside the system and just treat that as a sort of an input to the system, which is the demand for speed. Um, uh, if you now talk about a democracy, and all the people voting, and all the employments, those employed by government bodies to actually manage what happens in, a, in, a, in something as complex as a democracy, nearly all of the component parts are intentional systems. They're all, you know, they're humans. We're all humans and groups of humans. You know, each, each group of humans could be another system as well. Each individual human is a system. So cybernetics is actually much more concerned with that um, that sort of social management, how how humans manage themselves. Mm -hmm. 
and quite a lot of people in system space are in fact almost dedicated entirely to that sort of that sort of aspect of it. So somewhere in there when I where I was reading your your work, you were talking about the um functional relations. Is that also part of the cybernetics or does that go beyond is that going so more I, would into say, I would I would say now we're talking systems language. So I, I if, if you think about it, I mentioned it in that example of um you mentioned the key and the lock, and I mentioned sort of furniture, and we mentioned the staircase. Most of those things, when it comes to defining them, you end up designing them by what they do or what they're intended to do. And systems thinking, for me, and again, you find different people with different definitions in different parts of this space, but the generic thing about a system for me is that you are describing things in terms of their functional relations. So this part the function of this part in relation to the whole, the function of the whole in relation to multiple parts, the function of the whole in terms of its super systems that it's part of, because everything is both system and subsystem. You know? mm -hmm. um, so for me, systems thinking is about thinking in terms of things, in thinking of, of things, anything, in terms of the functional relation of it and its parts or it and its external super parts um, yeah so when you talked about internal and external <clears throat> the internal is it, with the component parts and the processes and then the external would be its relation with the environmental systems and structures of the ecosystem yeah, yeah. and um that I mean, that obviously scales all the way up, whether you're talking about human system, I mean, biological mm -hmm. systems or mm -hmm. um, mechanical systems. Yeah. Um, a simple example that we've talked a lot about here is like a watch. The inside of the watch is maybe very complicated. I mean, it's got a lot of stuff going on in yeah. there, but, but um, you don't have to know what's going on inside the watch in order to be able to use it from the outside. Right. No, because there's a huge, and, and again, there's a huge variation in what might actually be happening inside, you know, different forms of electronic watch and different forms of mechanical watch and different hybrids of both. So you can be completely oblivious to that and still read the watch. And, still, and regardless of what the yeah. watch is intended yeah. for, the external circumstances can have yeah. amazing um, consequences upon the watch, you know. You know, somebody could get mad and step on it, and then that's the end of the yeah, watch. Yeah. Or the yeah. or the watch can be being used for its natural purpose. Yeah. It can be being used for some other purpose. So um, that's right. But again, that, that would be you could still treat that in systems terms, in the sense of the watch has a specification in terms of whatever its internal parts it has to deliver this kind of output that tells mm -hmm. the time. We'll stick with fairly simple watches for now. Um, but it also has a whole set of other requirements which it hasn't got to be too heavy for one human to carry carry around with them you know um it has to be sufficiently robust that it doesn't suffer damage from certain expected in situations mm -hmm. and there'll be a set of limits on that like you might have a waterproof watch that's only waterproof to a certain depth or something like that mm -hmm. um, but you would expect dropping it on the floor from you know four feet shouldn't break it or something like that so that, but that's part of the specification but those spe all specifications in terms of something that might happen or is intended to happen or whatever so they're all functional relationships. Mm -hmm. um, so as I moved on in your writing, you start yeah. talking about, oh, I just lost it. It's very hard to do things, you know, from, uh, it's very hard to do things from- Multiple screens, yes. Well, from Twitter, especially because you can bring something up on Twitter and it's there. And then when you go back to get it, it'll just go back to the Twitter interface and you lose the yeah. anything that's in messages. So you talk yeah, about something. you talk about your own areas of interest being relational philosophy, brain, mind, and consciousness, mm. and mm. free energy principles and active inference. So maybe we could start with the relational philosophy mm. and then move to the other two. Well. In a way, that's what we were talking about. So I've been I've been saying functional relation. Mm -hmm. In other words, I think most relations are functional. There are some that are strictly physical, you know, space, dimensions, positions, positions in time, positions in space. But most relations of interest in complex systems are to do with what things do. Um, active relations of some sort. So, and again, this is a scalability thing. So 
I, I first came into this language through sort of, in, you know, in the engineering context of pieces of kit that were being put together to make some plant work a certain way or a facility work a certain way. But you realise, and of course you realise it's not new as well, that that sort of thinking has been part of pretty fundamental philosophy, you know, certainly metaphysics and certainly epistemology about you know, what we know and, and what things are. Um, so people like Whitehead and James and others have have, um, have written whole metaphysics based on, on, on this kind of idea that everything is defined in terms of events or processes that happen between things process a process view of the world rather than a um so that kind of relational philosophy and what you discover is despite the sort of persistence of the mental model that we mostly carry around in everyday life now of physical things and their position even if the positions are dynamic in the world um most things can be modeled in a and we would contend are better modelled in terms of what they do rather than what they physically are. Another way of saying that is what things physically are is better thought of in terms of what they do. And that that's taking the scalability right back to not just to the smallest microscopic physics, but to metaphysics itself and saying, well, that's just the best way to think about the world. And again, that's not new. It's not just not new in a sort of um, intellectual sense of, you know, simply writing a metaphysics to describe the world that way. But if you think about just prehistoric or pre-intellectual societies, mostly thought about their position in the world in those terms. You know, the, um, you know, my position in the world, position of all the other living things in the world relative to the world and relative to me. Most of those things are thought of in terms of interactions, what they do. And... Um, um, even taking down the, just the act, what um, James would have called radical empiricism, which even just the act of experiencing something is a relationship happening between you and the thing, or the two things experiencing each other. There's the sort of mutuality in, in, in experiencing, which has got nothing to do with things like um, um, the sort of quantum physics and decidability and all, and observer disturbance like that, that's it's not to do with that this is just much more fundamental just saying experience is about two things interacting whether it's you and a thing or two things experiencing each other there's a mutual interaction well, the, I don't know, that's much, popped, much... the other thing that popped up in my head when you were talking when hmm. you were emphasizing what things hmm. what they do because um I'm sure you're familiar with John Verbeke and, and he's very yeah. interested in JJ Gibson and Wolfgang Smith yeah. has been on the show a couple of times and he's very interested in JJ Gibson. And that's all yeah. about the, the, uh, you know, the cup that when you look at the cup, you don't see a cup, you see that this is a place for coffee, <laughs> drink coffee out of, right? Precisely, yeah. So, and, and that also ties in, in this kind of a random thought, but, um, with Jordan Peterson's statement that your your values are betrayed by your actions. So you might say, you might even think you believe a certain thing, but mm. if it's not oh, yeah. played out in your actions, it's not really a part of your belief system. And the way to figure out what you actually believe is to look at your own actions, what you oh, do. Yeah. And uh, it occurred to me that maybe one of the things that has happened in the last I don't know how many hundred years is that we've moved more and more and more towards this intellectual um, identification of who we are. And so we can, we can talk, we can say what we think, we can write books about what we think, but it doesn't really percolate down to our actions. And so we've mm -hmm. lost touch between the thinking and the doing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the only qualifier I'd add to that is that even thinking and speaking and writing are actions um mm -hmm. but um but yes we got so focused on these intellectual actions that we've forgotten all of the more direct participatory actions which are mm -hmm. you know what you do yeah and exactly. what you do in relation to other things so yeah so it's a bit of a truism but yes absolutely you are what you do not what you say but even choosing to say something is an action you know so an awful uh, you get you get into the realm of rhetoric you know it's like when we're having a conversation, what are you and I trying to do here? <laughs> mm -hmm. we're, we're trying to 
communicate something we're trying to maybe spread some understanding of something there's always a purpose behind mm -hmm. even even mm -hmm. it's only when you get to a very sort of uh formalized structure of a given kind of you know review document or a thesis or an argument in some syllogistic aristotelian sense then then if you like oh that goes out and the entire content is in the logic in in the language that you've used but but in fact I'm, I'm less concerned about that. And I, I know Vivek, I don't know him very well. I guess I've just decided he's talking about very similar things, but I'm not seeing anything fantastically new from his perspective. I might be missing something, but I've not taken that much interest in it. And he's definitely speaking about the same things. But um, sorry, I slightly lost my thread there. Um, sorry, I've lost my thread there. What was I saying? Well, you were talking. Well, we were you were talking about the the first point was the relational philosophy, and you were yeah. talking about Whitehead and James, and that things are defined based on what happens between them. Yes, the participation. Yes, that's right. We were talking. Yes, the, the last thing we done was this: um, what people say and what they do are two different things. But in fact, even and it's with so much communication these days, you know, social media being the epitome of com communications overload. Everything everybody says is an action for a reason, you know, whether it's just a reaction to something or whether it's they want to make a point or score a point or whatever it is that an awful lot of communication is our actions at these days because there's so many ways of communicating very informally. But yeah, this was the point I was getting at. So when I got sidetracked by Vivekki, yep. Yeah. In the human world, a lot of communication is our actions and it's not very formally defined. It is very much behavioral. Like you said, your piece of software is going to measure things about our interaction here. And an awful lot of communication is behavioral. Even when it's written, you have you why did you put it in that tweet? Why did you put it in that post? You know, why did you put it in that email? It's an awful that's an awful lot of that. In, in... When you say behavioral, are you speaking of agenda driven or do you have another meaning for that? Well, yeah, I mean, it, like rhetoric, you know, agenda might be a pejorative word, but yeah, we all have a reason for doing things, whether mm -hmm. they're part of some very well thought out, consistent agenda, or whether they're just part of just the general um, cut and thrust of everyday life. You've still got a reason for doing it. They might not always be the reason you think they are. I mean, in fact, that, in a way, that's an off, that's a large part of the issue, is that, and it's the Jordan Peterson point you meant, which is the formality of what we say and why we think we're saying it might not actually be the real reason you have to you have to be a bit more reflective participatory to understand that you might say that's what you meant and you may say that's why you said it but again they're in they're just actions that have their own motives so in a sense yeah everything has an agenda but how complex and well thought out that agenda is is, is hugely variable as well well and yeah, I mean, we always have a reason, but we, there may be an agenda going on in the background that we don't even know about. <laughs> yeah, you mean, yeah, yeah. So right? you, you, again, when I said pejorative, you're implying hidden agenda. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yes. Yeah, hidden, yeah. hidden accidentally or hidden hidden deliberately. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, again, that's a large that's a large part of how I got interested in the sort of the wider epistemology is is that the intent in a piece of information is very important. If you think you can just have a written definition and decode everything based on that, you're going to miss an awful lot of what real intentions and real meanings are. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah which so I guess that those... gets into some of the postmodern problem, mm. um, which we we can or I mean we don't have to get into that um, because the, the, your next point was on brain mind consciousness. Yeah, and uh, you brought up Ian McGilchrist and Mark Solms there, so I thought it might be kind of interesting to explore that. Yeah, so so this whole thing of dealing with things as systems um, and dealing with functional interactions beyond just definitions of the objects, brains and minds as objects, um, it's just another example of the scalability of this kind of thinking. So. The bit I've been involved, interested in most since I left the sort of industrial information modeling has actually really been effectively consciousness. Um, and one of my pet hates at the moment is people forever saying it's some um, insurmountable mystery and nobody agrees and 
there's so many different theories and none of them are consistent. So I actually think there's a very consistent story coming together amongst people right now about how this stuff really works. And I, I cast that now under a sort of systems thinking model, exactly like Mark Solms does. Is Mark, sorry, is Mark Solms someone you've actually interacted with yourself? A number of already? times, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, thought, I thought you had, yes, okay, there's good. probably so you know what, five episodes, four, four or five episodes that he's been on. Yeah. The first one was just him and I talked yeah. And then, oh yes, and Mike Levin as well. Yes. And then yes. he talked with Mike Levin a couple of times. Yeah. And then That's he it. okay. Did he also talk to John Verbeke? I'm not sure. Ian McGilchrist has oh, had I a have, session. I with have so many episodes Don, now I can't. Like, like, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, okay. So fine. So I'm just checking where we're talking from. Yeah. So yeah. so I, I yeah, so in, in the in the piece of writing you're referring to, I was actually contrasting McGilchrist and Song. So mm -hmm. I think they're both right they're both 99 percent right if anything they're both 100 percent right they're just giving us a different story they're actually friends go, which is very interesting <laughs> they know each other yeah they do know each other but I've, so far and i've had lots of heated conversations about this with other other fans of both people neither seems to have referenced the other as far as i can see oh in well anything. In, in the talk that i had with mark solmes he talked quite a bit about ian he said yeah he said okay good in any in anything published or written they've certainly not referred to each other's work. Yeah. You're right. I know Solms knows him, Miguel Chris, because I've I've exchanged conversations with him as well about that. But not in any no, not not in any published paper or book does it, it one or the other use the other as a reference. And that that does create some quite interesting discussion. But there is a difference, and I think this is why they probably are still slightly dancing around each other at the moment. I think they're both absolutely right, and the only the only difference, it's easy to say, is Ian has very much gone for the left right hemisphere differences are more to the point of left right hemisphere communications of, of the newly enlarged parts of the brain communicating via the much longer established part symmetrical parts of the brain uh non-divided parts of the brain um whereas mark solms has very much gone for the uh the, ver the vertical stack of old and gradually newer stuff and the, and the, the decision making the consciousness making the um subjective experiencing parts of the brain being a stack of things in this so-called um decision making triangle which he got from Panksep, i think but anyway he, he the difference between them apart from the fact they've just got two different views one's one's looking across the brain and one's looking up and down the brain they're saying an awful lot of stuff which is very similar in terms of how we misunderstand how it works and therefore their models are producing much better solutions. The difference is Ian McGilchrist and most of the people who are his supporters of his thinking are very anti using this sort of information, computation, systems, language. They see, they see a sort of mechanical, regimented sort of mechanical thing being pushed into a domain that they see as an entirely sort of, um, well, even spiritual and sacred, to use Ian's language. And I use I use the word sacred, actually. We can talk about that as well. It's, there are some things that are sacred in the physical, in the real world. <clears throat> but Ian is very loath to get into like, discussions where you use that kind of language because he says, no, no, you, you're sort of dehumanizing the human mind by using that language. Whereas Mark Solms is very explicitly exactly the opposite. He's taken on board the entire language of systems, and you very nearly mentioned it earlier, one of the key things when you start talking about things and systems that they're part of and systems that they're part of and things that are parts of that system is you're talking about the identity of things, the boundaries around things. Mm -hmm. And Ian has very much used um, a thing called active inference, which is a new set of theories around how systems define and maintain themselves by having a boundary across which they actively infer what they need to do across the boundary. So it's it's the essence of life, basically. Um, Ian still seems to prefer to keep a sort of partition between the stuff that is right-brained and the stuff that is clearly left-brained and simply persuading us to kind of balance that thinking in life. Well, see, the way I, I way I picture it, after having, I haven't talked personally to Ian McGilchrist yet. Mm -hmm. um, actually, he was supposed to be on like three years ago. And we had it all set up and 
And, uh, and then at the last minute, they contacted me and they said, you know, the demands of his new book were just overwhelming him. And so we okay. canceled and never have been able to reschedule because of the book tour and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, okay. yep. Yep. as I read his book and as I look at the left and right hemispheres, the way he described them, it seems so clear to me. And but I'm sure he would disagree with me, but it just seems clear to me that it's talking about a marriage. The left and the right hemispheres are in a marriage because that's the way yes. marriage works. <laughs> yes, and this whole idea kind of opponent processing in a way, the in the in the way that marriages work at their best work in this way where you have two disparate entities and they're put together into this pressure cooker and it results in something if you stay together in that it results in something higher something some is more than the sum of the parts absolutely yeah. so i tend to use yeah so you have distinct identity you, you can distinctly mm -hmm. talk about the husband and the wife or the, the mm -hmm. one partner or the left and the right and you can talk about them distinctly but the essence of what makes it worthwhile is how they i use the word integrate rather mm -hmm. than that. but yes they don't they don't merge to be one thing you can but you but they integrate sufficiently that you can talk about the whole thing as a thing as a marriage yes uh, never used that language before but it, it works fine but it, it yeah so it's about the nature of the interaction or the integration of the various processes is such that you get something that's much more than the sum of the two parts yeah mm -hmm. yeah so, right, so i said balance which was yeah far too a passive statement but yes it's not just balance them but it's actually actively integrate the two mm -hmm. so, yeah so it's not balanced to find something that's halfway between left and right brain it's a true integration the unity of left and right brain yeah, yeah. which is why yeah, comp i think compromise is so such a weak yeah. such a weak goal to shoot for right absolutely yeah so yeah, but balance has a very passive sort of um connotation which i didn't mean absolutely i'm definitely talking actively so just you talking about um compromise Somebody else who's quite influential in this space, well, sorry, was. Quite a lot of this is about management. Uh, and an awful lot of the thinkers in, in this sort of systems thinking and cybernetic space were essentially management consultants of various sorts mm. of people trying to help people to get organized. And one of the people very influential, actually very influential on Peter Drucker, who's probably one of the most famous management gurus, is Mary Parker Follett. And I'm probably going to misquote her here now, but one of her most famous sayings is something like, insofar as people think um, compromise is a desired solution, just so far as they don't understand the situation, or something like that. It's exactly the I've slightly mangled her phrasing, but mm -hmm. it's, it's what you were saying there. Um, and she's a sort of guru of management gurus but she's very she was actually quite famous in her day in the 1930s but she's typically a woman didn't publish a lot that's stuck around since but um she's almost entirely forgotten except by a few sort of enthusiasts so mary parker follow i recommend you investigate but sadly she's no longer around for you to interview but if you want to, if you want to read something yeah, i'll definitely look her up yeah i've got it i've got it noted here <clears throat> yeah yeah um yeah so that was the yeah, so we did the relational bit. We did the the mind, brain, and consciousness. Yeah, so uh, the bit the bit of it that that I'm quite excited about, particularly with Mark Solms, and I think Ian, if he would just actually integrate his thinking with Mark's more, I think Ian will find he's in the same space, but he's just holding off slightly, getting dragged into the systems space. Um, is I actually think they pretty well have the answer to all of these. Um, you know, lot age-old hoary questions around consciousness, you know, the so-called hard problem, um, you know, panpsychism, you know, and, and, and as an alternative to how do you get stuff like consciousness out of physical things and the whole monism and dualism, Cartesianism. There are just so many old questions in this space that just don't exist anymore if you listen to Clark Solms <laughs> and uh, Friston, who's, who's obviously someone whose work he took, took a lot of work with and then took a lot of work from. But um, so articulating and part of the problem actually is just language. It's articulating this in ways that people don't feel threatened by. You know, language doesn't make them feel uncomfortable. And I think that's the main problem with the McGiltrist camp is that they're just very loath to talk in these sort of systems and boundaries and 
things that are beyond literature and um, history of various civilizations. They're very good on the humanities side of it in terms of seeing the difference of how integrated left-right brain models work versus sort of Western objective, logically modeled world. Um, but they're still not managing to find a language that bridges the gap. Whereas I think, I actually think Mark Solms has cracked it. So that's a part of mine. So a lot of my writing now is is to try, well, it, it's, it's this, um, I say scalability again. So I, I'm really doing philosophy and epistemology now. So whilst I think Mark has, cracked it or with, with a bit more work of people around it, helping communicate it and maybe change the language to suit a wider audience. I think he, I think he has it. Um, I'm actually now, I think it might've been the third point that I shared with you was with um, scalability this one step further, right back to the sort of metaphysics now and the sort of stuff that um, yeah, you were talking to, what's his name? Seagal. And uh, he, he's a, he's a, he's a, Matt He's Seagal. a big fan. Matt Seagal, that's right, yes. And um his Twitter handle is footnotes to Plato. It is, yeah. So he's also a he's a, he's, a, he's an actual philosopher. I, I'm a sort of amateur philosopher, he's an actual philosopher by training. And but he is also a an advocate of um Whitehead's philosophy in a big way as well. And I think there's there's room now for a version of Whitehead's metaphysics in the language of information and systems. Because one of the problems with Whitehead, although a lot of people would say he was onto something and he was right in what he wrote, um, the language is extremely, like a lot of things, a lot of neologisms. He's invented a lot of words to say what he needs to say, and that it gives you a very strange language about events and nexus. And he uses a lot of words that exist in the dictionary, but in quite different ways to what they originally used. So it's actually very hard to share in a conversation what he's saying, unless you meet someone who's actually already got it. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a space in philosophy, and it's again, it's not new, it's not something I've invented, um, for an information-based um, metaphysics that says the most fundamental thing in the universe is bits of information. Everything physical and everything mental comes from that in a sentence. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of what I'm focusing on writing up. So that a lot, whilst a lot of the stuff has been sidetracked in this whole consciousness set of questions, which were getting in the way for me, um, I can I feel now that's in safe hands. That's been solved. We can now take it one step back right to the fundaments of everything physical and mental. So when you're talking about um, information-based metaphysics, what, what do you mean by that exactly? Um, well, let's, let's start by what it's not. So you have this problem with it, it now, if you think of physical things as sort of material and energetic things, mm -hmm. uh, and you can't see any way of creating not just creating mental things from it, but in any way a mental thing could interact with those things, since it doesn't appear to be an energy of any of the forms that, that physics recognises. Um, what you can do is take one step behind those two things and say the most fundamental thing is just, well, information. So there's two things I'm using the word information. Today. One is, in the natural language sense, we mean it now, some piece of knowledge, some, some piece of knowledge about the world. But it's a piece of knowledge about the world because it represents a difference between two things or an interaction between two things. Every piece of information is just, a, a, I call it significant differences, the language I use. Mm -hmm. um, if, 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 there's, if there's two things in the world that have a significant difference, that difference is a piece of information and it can be the yep. driver for it. Yeah, I've been a talking about thing. that on here for like five years. So, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I feel like I've been talking about about 20 years, but it's just gradually more. Well, I mean, more, I'm more... just saying on this channel, I've been talking yeah, about yeah, it that yeah, way. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, because if even if you thought of the entire universe as just being fundamental particles, and that's, let's just say, let's just say that that's all there is is fundamental particles. Mm -hmm. 
every one of those particles is still unique because it's occupying a different location. Oh yeah. That yeah. location has information in it. Right? Yeah. You, this well, location. That thing and in, in, in uh and that so, location is a piece of information. Yes, Sorry, exactly. I'm just gonna close the door here. Just had a door banging in the wind. The one time I made the comment on here that that um, that the universe at the Big Bang, what came into what came into being was uh, matter, and or I might have not used the word came into being, but at the Big Bang, there's matter and energy and information. And yeah. somebody jumped on there and they said. If that were true, there would be a Nobel Prize in that. <laughs> like, well, I can't <laughs> prove it's true, but it just seems so logical to me. Yeah. 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 And and I think that fits in. Have you looked at Wolfram's physics at all? Wolfram's new fundamental physics? Uh, yes, not for a long time, though. Um, he was part of my thought journey uh, i'm reading him but it's I, I don't refer to him very much these days for anything specific but, but uh -huh. absolutely well yeah. i mean i just think the picture that he draws there with with his new mm. fundamental physics is uh yeah. um very much whether it's true or not it opens an mm. avenue for thinking about yeah this idea of of information because i think when a lot of people hear you say something like um, information is fundamental, their mind Im immediately goes to, well, then we're a simulation. Then it's all <laughs> digital, right? Mm. Yeah. Um, no, but again, that's another one of these, you know, artificial problems that, you know, David Chalmers and the hard problem and, and, and all these zombie experiments and so on that, that, that thought experiments reportedly not real experiments just thought experiments um are just misunderstandings of how it works absolutely yeah. so you can think about the idea of how a zombie might work but but why it's just how things actually work it's not a simulation that's what things are you know when people talk about consciousness is an illusion what they're really saying is well some aspects of consciousness are clearly illusory but that doesn't mean it's not real you know a magician's trick is real it's just not real it's real and not real at the same time it's just that's just the way it works um, so it's, it's a sort of language barrier to talking about it that we somehow introduce the word illusion or simulation and, and it's like well no that is just how it works well i think the same problem arises when you use the word reality yeah, yeah. because people well, misunderstand again, because what now... reality is because hmm. it it just is Real, real reality is what is it is what it yeah. is and mm. and and people try to say well no i think reality is this or i think reality is that well no reality is what reality is <laughs> exactly and all of these alternative things are just like subsets of it you know the, the physical aspects of it the temporal aspects of it whatever yeah absolutely um yeah and, and that's kind of why i'm getting into trying to elaborate this as a metaphysics now it is is that um um, those things well I've used the word ontology it's basically about existence and, and when you get to existence it's, it, you you start to qualify it with well what really exists and as you say you're really just asking what's reality and, and so in fact some of some of my um, less developed bits of writing are all about trying to describe the, you know the idea of a, th a thing and no thing what what is something that exists as, as opposed to some is, does the concept of something that doesn't exist actually mean anything? Um, because just having the conversation of, about something that doesn't exist, well, it does exist in in this mental conceptual space because I've just I've just had the thought, and that thought clearly exists. It doesn't exist in a sense that an orthodox physicist might have thought that he was using the word exist, but clearly exists. So then, so, what existed before thought was possible? Um. Uh, yes, yeah, so there are definitely some leaps in evolution where different things became possible. But the, the the value of the information model is you can explain them all with the same set of processes. So, um, yes, yeah, so when two indeterminate things existed and had an interaction between them, they didn't have any more things with which to process that interaction. They just both experienced it. End of that was it, and that 
that's probably the simplest thing in the world. It's just one one gap between two things. When you use the word experience, are you using it in, in the terms of a conscious experience, or you no, mean no, it just no. happened? No, it just, it happened. just it was um, an event. Yes, and both both participated in the event. Yes, yeah. Well, but, I mean, so I think, this is where language breaks down because even participated absolutely. is anthropomorphizing. So, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> No, that's right. And I think a lot of it now is just a language problem. It's getting more people comfortable with talking about these things using this kind of language. And, and my feeling is that we, that's actually what we have to do, I mean, more philosophical conversation now. So I don't think there's any way we're going to get, well, almost by definition, if you think of Psalms and McGilchrist, there's no way we're going to get a very tight, logical, objective, objective definition of what we're talking about. Kind of, That's just not the way the world is. The world is more than our logical objective definitions of things the world is a lot more than that so so don't be surprised if we can't describe the whole world in, in a set of those kind of definitions um so you kind of have two choices you've either got to invent lots of new words for the things you're talking about that are not those things or you've just got to persuade more people that when we talk about those things we do mean more than we, we previously did we were just a bit too narrow in our view before um and having seen examples of both, I'm just fairly converted to the idea that this is now just a long story of persuasion and communication and just finding ways of getting people comfortable with the language. Rather than, in, it might be the best way to sell books, might be to invent some new name for what it is we're talking about, and that might turn into a bestseller or something because it's a word nobody's heard before. But I'm not sure that itself will will necessarily catch on beyond readers of that book or readers of that. It, it won't get in. An area that we haven't talked about is um, someone, a, a common a common person behind a lot of these um, thinkers is Robert Persig and his Zen of the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, which is, I think, how I got connected with... Um, with Sevilla? Sevilla, yeah. Yeah. Um, and she was reading both his books, Set of the Art, and she was reading Lila as well, and she was making comments on them. It's amazing how many people in this space would cite Robert Persig as a kind of a very influential in their thought trajectory. Not many of them would actually reference anything very specific from him in any specific thesis of their own now. And I know I've gone for many years without referring to him. And I'm only referring to him again now because I'm discovering more. He's actually in the background behind a lot more people. He and Michael Trist as well. But again, you won't find a single reference to him in it. <laughs> well, and, and also, I just talked to this guy last week, um, David Schindler, Love yeah, and yeah. Modern Predicament, and he referenced Persig as being extremely influential on him when yeah. he was a young man. Yeah, absolutely. Fine. Well, and again, I was, a, I was a late developer in that sense because I think I said I was a fairly traditional sort of STEM-type geek, you know, and I didn't read books like that. <laughs> So it was it was not until I was 40 something that I read that. Um, so but it I think it was one of my own seed crystal moments. This is a, to use a language that Percy uses that kind of it was an aha moment that an awful lot of confused thinking of the something that we're missing here and I can't quite express what it is was suddenly came together in Robert Persick. Now he used he coined the well, he coined the word, but he chose a new meaning for the word quality. And everything in his writing from Zen and the Art and Lila is about quality or the metaphysics of qualities again. Mm -hmm. But again, it's one of those words that's got so much baggage in everyday use. It's very hard to get people to persuade to use it to mean what we've just been talking about, that fundamental reaction at any scale between two things participating with each other. That's what quality mm -hmm. is as far as he's concerned. Um what I mentioned before is um, Jamesian radical empiricism. It's it's just the most fundamental stuff is the partic participation between things. And that's all he was talking about with that. And he went on to classify his whole metaphysics in terms of different levels of structure created by quality, different types of quality. But um, from amongst, part, partly because it's written entirely rhetorically, he does make a lot of reference to sources, but it's not written like a technical thesis. And he never engaged in um, sort of intellectual debate with other philosophers to, to promote his position. It's probably never going to become the accepted view. Um, so we just have to find one that will fit 
Um, but an awful lot of what he said, if you, you know, you can change the words. And again, I'm effectively using an awful lot of his structures and thinking, but I've just changed the word quality for information. But you know, I could write, I could draw all the same oh, pictures. That's a, as that seems like a huge leap. Yeah. <laughs> that's so yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, um... you know, but he has physical information, you know, and biological, well, he calls it quality, you know, he's got physical quality and biological quality and social quality and intellectual quality. And, and for me, so they're just like his, his patterns, his static and dynamic yeah. patterns. Patterns of, yeah, yeah. Patterns of value, he calls it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, so he, I have not read the book. I've only watched mm. some of Sevilla's episodes and had a number yeah. of conversations with her about it. And, mm. and so I probably have the wrong conception mm. but i thought what that quality was something that was drawing um drawing these static and dynamic patterns into something rather than yeah. than the static and dynamic patterns themselves being quality that quality was yeah he, well he uses the word value as well to emphasize the non-objective nature of quality as as well as but but yeah so when well, he changes he changed his own language himself actually um and there's a third book came out last year but posthumously um he, he used he just called it quality in the first book he just called it quality it wasn't until he got to Lila that he actually started to talk about static and dynamic quality and when you read it that way you realize what he meant by quality in the first book is what he's now calling dynamic quality so like the same as I do keep qualifying when I say things that sound a bit static or passive I mean a dynamic version of it and he, he did the same um the static ones are the patterns that get captured and sort of frozen in something you know, so frozen in a rock frozen in an atom uh oh frozen in a, a, a one living thing an individual living thing so which is why in, in these levels from physical biological social and intellectual to use his language um there's a very strong left right brain correlation in there as well but um he talks about these patterns of value but they're they comprise this stuff called quality so the whole background is quality in a What's the word he uses? Um, um, sort of unstructured. He uses a word. That's not the word he uses. Um, the aesthetic continuum, he calls it. So it's just a, it's it's just the stuff, the background stuff. It, in an old scientific format, you might have called it the ether. You know, it's just the stuff of which everything else in which everything else exists. Um. Dynamic quality is the actual act of, of interaction between any two things. And the static patterns are all those patterns that get left behind after the interactions that we then build on to build something else. So the physical, the biological, and so on. So there's the stuff in which everything else exists, and then the quality is the the interactions. The dynamic quality is interactions, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I can see all that, de definitely. And so I, I find it's just... I mean, you, you know, I, I sent you a very brief overview of kind of what's inside my brain. <laughs> mm. And and so, you know, whenever I hear anything like this, I'm like, oh, okay. Mm. Yeah, okay, I see how that works, yeah. Mm. So. What time is it there, by the way? All of a sudden, it started getting dark for you. I was going to say, I actually chose this time because I thought, well, it, it's got, it'll be light. But in fact, we've had a very overcast afternoon. In fact, it's now raining outside, isn't it? Uh -huh. So it's quite dry outside now. So it's quarter past, 20 past seven in the evening. Oh, OK. OK. Anyway, that's what I, we were arranging this a couple of weeks ago. We'd had our first few really bright, glorious days. We all thought spring's arrived, hooray. But since then, we've had a, several very cold and frosty days, several very stormy days, and lots of rain in the last few days. So... It's, we it's sure we've enough. had we've had a spring like that here. I mean, mm -hmm. nor normally where I live in Northern California, spring starts in February pretty much. You mm. get a lot of sunny weather. 
We didn't have any sunny weather for months. And then Sunday, which was Easter Sunday, we had a glorious, beautiful, sunny day. And yesterday mm -hmm. was a pretty nice sunny day until mid-afternoon. And then it started getting cloudy. And here we are again in the cold and cloudy. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a very strange year. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I haven't got any cinema lighting set up in this room, I'm afraid. So. Well, so have you had a conversation with Sibylla yet? Um, not not a not a face to face conversation. We've we've exchanged. I mean, that's how we got to know each other. We we, I think we contacted through Twitter, then had a few email and messaging exchanges about what she was doing, and kind of commented on some of the things she was doing. We've never really necessarily tried to get on the same page as to whether I agree whether what she's saying about Persig is right or whether I'm saying about it is right. We, we just both realise we're talking about the same stuff, and she was kind of quite interested. I have a I have a little bit of fame in this space because I, I actually captured a lot of stuff about Persig as part of my own journey. In fact, I left it. Most of the stuff I've been saying to you about him now is stuff I haven't really tried to say anything about for. 10 or 15 years if I'm being honest this was quite early in my process but I'm only gradually coming back to looking at it again more seriously but I've I've had a a, bi um, a biographical timeline page about Robert Persig on the web one of the first things I actually did back in about 2003 or so two or three or something and that's become quite a big source for lots of other researchers so I have a web page with lots of links to Persig information a lot of people connect on Persig through me just because I've got several web pages out there. Can I get I'm a link to that for the description yeah, sure. section? Sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, there are several actual web pages and websites set up with the main names that make more sense for Persig information, but there's, there's just been a bit of a gap uh, in the space in the people that did take it seriously academically back in the early 2000s and before then, um, got very excited about doing stuff, but they've just kind of fallen by the wayside and doing their own private projects now. And the, the one guy that uh, actually has a PhD specifically in, a philosophy PhD specifically in the work of Robert Persig has um, just been very in inactive recently. So I'm just basically left holding the baby in terms of oh. the web is concerned. <laughs> wasn't really part of my plan. I've always used the idea of, if you understand the trajectory of somebody's life and thinking, you, you're better at understanding what they're saying. Mm -hmm. you know, if you just read someone's book, you either really understand it or you don't. But if you actually read a bit of biography about a person and understand how their thought process came to what it was they wrote, I mm -hmm. feel you understand a lot better. So, And that's an idea I picked up from one of the earliest bloggers on the web about the idea if you present things as timelines, you get a be much better understanding of, of what what's intended. So I, I created a timeline of Robert Persig and his mm -hmm. thought. And that's just and because it has a lot of links to lots of sources of information in it. It became a sort of go-to source for a lot of people. I've not maintained it for many years, but it still gets a lot of hits. Well, I mean, it it totally makes yeah. sense because I think one of the ways that we, we get in so much trouble is we look back at somebody's thinking, pick something out as though that's crystalline forever solid yeah and then yeah. start quoting that and in influencing people meanwhile that guy had that thought he moved on from it came yeah. to yeah, a absolutely. deeper more important thought sometime later in his life mm. we're not mm. looking at that we're just looking at this thing he said early on right and it gets people into a lot of trouble <laughs> that's my pet hate in that space is dan dennett i'm a big fan of dan dennett as a philosopher he's some age now but he's uh, still two in a world talking about his books and his work. But um, so many people quote him from his book called Consciousness Explained, which was 1991, which is 32 years ago now. Yeah. Uh, so many people, just that's the only book they quote. If I, it's a book that's got the nickname of Consciousness Not Explained, because clearly it didn't really explain consciousness. But what he was trying to do was show what it would take to explain consciousness. The book itself, he would admit, didn't really explain consciousness. But so many people, when they quote Dan Dennett, say, oh, Dan Dennett said this. I say, where did he say that? Oh, in his 1991. But yeah, I know that. But he's written 20 books since then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Have you read any of those? <laughs> well, and, and, you know, people, <laughs> one of my one of my kids would say things like, you know, well, so-and-so was such a jerk in high school. I don't want to have anything to do with them. And I'm like... 
that was high school. You have no idea who that person is today. People evolve, they change, you know, and. Uh, yeah, well, evolution, just, just the word evolution was, has been, you know, really important part of my story all the way through. And that's, again, is something that I got from Persig, which was, you know, Darwinian or otherwise, you know, Persig, sorry, evolution applied at so many more levels than just life itself. You know, the whole, the whole of the mental era, the whole of, you know, memes, the idea of memetics, how ideas get shared and how ideas evolve is, is pretty fundamental to everything that we're talking about. So you know, evolution is one of those key words. Um, well, in the in the science of ideas, hmm. I guess it depends. When you use the word evolve, are you using the, the term to mean progress or just change? Because in the realm of ideas, what a lot of things that have evolved have actually devolved rather than you know. Progress. Yeah, so now, I'd get, so <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. So so. Yeah, you know, markets can go down as well as up. Yes, yeah, so, so evolution isn't always necessarily in a positive direction according to one particular measure. Absolutely, yeah, a lot of stuff is degenerately evolving. And in fact, in many ways, that's my one of my main drivers in this 21st century communication-rich world that we're in now is, and that's why I mentioned Dennett and memetics, is part of the problem we have now is because we have such a dominant left brain model such a dominant instant communication model that the ideas that win are the bad ones. The ideas that win are the easy ones, mm -hmm. not the good ones. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we, we're in danger of degenerating lots of lowest common denominators all over the place rather than the best stuff. And that, that's actually for me is one of my main drivers throughout, throughout all of this. I would never have guessed when I started it, I was going to get into sort of all sorts of metaphysical questions and sort of things around it. Well, that's one of the things that has just troubled me for years, this yeah. whole idea that the ideas that win are the easy ones, because what so often happens is, yeah. let's say in the in the political realm, what can be captured in a soundbite is what wins the day, especially if it's a compelling idea. But often to combat that idea with truth might take a, you know, a four page treatise that nobody's going to listen to. Nevertheless, that's the reality of things. So yeah. what do you do? Then then yeah. you just continue to devolve into this um, yeah, polarized absolutely. mess that we're in right now. Yeah. That's mm. a horrible place to end. <laughs> do you have something <laughs> cheerful to say before Evolution. we finish up? <laughs> <laughs> mm. No, but it, it's it is a driver, and that's why people well, obviously that's why people like Ian McGilchrist are so inspiring in this space because he's able to point out you know what it is we're doing wrong, and where we need to focus our efforts, and um, that and that there might be a um, a potential for for improvement. Speaking of Ian McGilchrist, let me just play two minutes. Which uh, this is a a video that um, I watched years ago, and and. Uh, grabbed onto again the other day because I thought it was such a great video. Did you ever see this one? It's uh, Ian McGilchrist and Jordan Peterson. It's only a half an hour early in Peterson's um, trajectory. And that these two guys had this really great, very honest conversation with each other. Yes, this was between the two books. This was after, uh, after his first book um, when the work was being done, I think, to generate his uh, divided brain film. It wasn't part of the film, but it was about the same time. Um, yes, so, yeah, um, I, I definitely I definitely have seen this. I've seen yeah, this is the master and his emissary and uh, and yeah, Jordan Peterson is asking him about some things. And I'm just going to play the last oh, two minutes here because I think it's really interesting. And it's a more maybe a more upbeat place to to end. Um, about the creation, which I don't know if you know it, but it's it's absolutely riveting to me. Um, the idea is that the primary being ends off the ground of all being, um, yeah. needs something other to come into being, mm -hmm. the creation. Mm -hmm. And that creation, what does that ends off do? This is his first act. Is it to stretch out a hand and make something? Not a bit. The first act is to withdraw, to create a place in which there can be something other than paint off. Mm -hmm. And so the, the first stage is called Sim Sum, and it sounds negative, as so many creative things do. 
withdrawal. And then in that space, there are uh, vessels and a spark comes out of ends off and falls into the vessels and they all shatter. Mm -hmm. And that's called uh, Sephirat Hakeli. Yes, the yes, I've across that in Jung. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yes. Yeah. And then there is the third stage, repair, in which um, what has just been fragmented is yeah. restored into something greater. Mm -hmm. And so this process carries on. And it's, in my terms, very like what happens with the hemispheres. The right hemisphere is the one that is first accepting. It is sort of actively receptive, if you can put it that way, to whatever is new. You were talking about yeah. Ockham and Goldberg and so on. Um, and then whatever that is, is then sort of processed by the left hemisphere at the next stage into categories. So it's a bit of that. And yeah. <laughs> try to understand it. But of course, whatever it is, is much bigger than any of the categories. So they all break down mm -hmm. and it gets restored in the right hemisphere into a new whole, um, the, the tikkun, the repair. Mm -hmm. That's tikkun, right? T i k k u n. T i k k u n. Right, 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 right. And I think mean, you know, the, the 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 kind of um, easy way of, of thinking about it is learning a piece of music. You're first of all attracted to it as a whole. You then realise that you need to practice that piece at bar twenty eight, and you realise mm -hmm. that you know at, at, at bar sixty four there's a return to the dominant or something. And uh, then actually, when you go on stage, you've got to. Um, just forget all about that. But it's not that that work was lost, it's just that it's no longer present. Right, yeah. right. Which seems to me to be a, a, a perfect description of both ontology and epistemology, because right at the end there where he talks about um, mm -hmm. the way those, those three levels break down in learning a piece of music or in making a piece of art or any of those things, it... it mm -hmm. uh, it requires that process, right? Or anything creative, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. No, I completely agree. And it, again, it also illustrates that it, there's no static, uh, unified model here. It, it's about things passing between things. Mm -hmm. you know? um, it's that dynamic cyclic process or pseudo cyclic process that that, um, that actually creates things. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the great things just, about the internet is that we can have these conversations and talk to each mm, other and keep these things mm. uh, kind of moving. But one of the reasons I asked you about it, Sibylla, is I thought if you guys would like to talk to each other, I could just host you and then you could talk yeah, could to do. each other. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't looked very closely at her stuff, but it, we clearly have a quite well, a Well, she's mostly interest. focused on piercing. So, I mean, it's yeah. be a yeah. conversation about piercing yeah. and about your... Yeah. You said you're starting to come back to his work, so there must be something in your current. Yes, it's it's just discovering more people that are, that own up to the fact that whether whether they mention him in their work or not, in that that they were influenced by him along the way, and uh, and uh, he, he might be destined to always be in that position in the sense of he's not going to write anymore now because he died five or six years ago, um, and uh, he never wrote things in a sort of academic intellectual context so it's very hard for academics to refer to it um but again going back to the creative stuff the artistic stuff um because you know he, he was a creator of two novels you know and that's really where his skill was um and the bit we haven't managed to talk about and we i suggest we don't start now but maybe just part for another time is um but, um, how am i going to put it um Sorry, I lost my thread again. <laughs> um, we talk. He was talking about. He was talking about withdrawing the artistic process. Yeah, yes. withdrawing and then the shattering, and then the oh, yes, the withdrawing. Yes, the withdrawing. Yes, one of um, yeah, what one of my uh, adages is freedom runs on rails. So creativity, people think freedom is about having no boundaries. There's a, you know, people thinking simplistically anyway, have this view that freedom is about not about boundaries, but in fact, freedom is about having the right shaped space in which to do the things that you need. Mm -hmm. So, you know, railways work because they have rails and the wheels fit between the rails. One of them, the railways wouldn't work. So that's where the freedom runs on rails comes from. But 
it's also that this idea that creativity is about having the right constraints around something. So if you have a continuum um, and you want something creative to happen, you don't start building on the continuum. It used in McGilchrist's example there. You just need to create the right shaped hole and then the creativity will happen. Um, and that's really important. Yep, yep, I absolutely agree. Yeah. It's so great. That's a good place to end. Thank you so much for jo and joining me, Ian, and uh, I hope we get to talk again. Yeah, I look forward to it. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Yeah, Bye for now.